which is a very exciting session of case discussion. And uh, the moderators for this session, Dr. Basu and Dr. Emerich, and I would also request Dr. Menon, who is now here, to uh, join us for chairing this session. And I invite the panelists, Dr. Gruenberg, Dr. Petrachi, Dr. Shankaracharya, and Dr. Satish. Without much ado, can I request Dr. Shankaracharya to start the presentation? I welcome my co-moderator, Juan Imerish, and uh, he may please invite his Argentinian colleagues, as I invite Dr. Shankar Acharya, who is the incoming president of the ASSI, to deliver the first talk, an interactive case discussion on a rare case of a laryngeal palsy in a cervicothoracic tuberculosis. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you all. I don't even remember if uh, Marcela Grenberg remembers me, but uh, he gave me a picture of a lake which is very silent, and then suddenly a crocodile jumps right vertically up. And this is such a case where I got stuck. So this is one of my big complications recently. So when Gautam asked me to talk about it, I thought this would be a good case to do. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Uh, this is a 14-year-old girl, uh, with no more comorbidities, absolutely fit and fine, with neck pain and difficulty to move since two months. Sir, please share your screen, sir. Please share your screen. You can't sh see my screen? No, yes, not yet. Oh, yeah. One second. Uh, Should we move on to the second presentation and come back to you, Shankar? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. So let us call uh, Dr. Satish. Satish, can you please share your presentation here? Yeah. Can you see? Yes. Yes. Yep. Good evening, everyone. I will straight away go to this unusual case of thoracic myelopathy. So here is a 19 year old male who came to me six months with the history of left lower limb weakness, occasional buckling of the knee and altered walking pattern of three months. And it all started when he started, you know, he was uh, Leg press, he did 200 kg because he was weighing himself about 120 kg. He wanted to reduce his weight, started going to the gym and started, you know, this problem when he once did a 200 kg leg press. And it progressively worsened uh, over a span of six months. So his motor power when he came to us was uh, four by five in the left lower limb. Proximal was much more weaker than the distal. He had a bilateral exaggerated deep tendon reflexes and has spastic gait. And if you see this gait, you know, he used to walk like this, literally, you know, and sometimes the both the knees used to buckle. So he used to drag left lower limb more than the right lower limb. <clears throat> so the clinically, he had a classical thoracic myelopathy with a predominant motor weakness. And this is his MRI. Okay, can anybody wants to comment on this? Basu? Yeah, uh, Shankar, I think you can start off being the one of the important panelists. You can just leave a comment before Satish can move on. Yeah. Gautam, you want to take this? Yeah, I'm not one of the panelists, but we cannot ask Marcelo. Marcelo, what would you do for something yeah. like this? What is the diagnosis here? No, I really appreciate you bring up this case because in almost 30 years of practice, I only saw one case exactly the same as you are showing. And to tell you the truth, the first time I saw it, uh, it was very difficult for me to understand the image. Luckily, in this case, you see the cord moving forward, so you can make some sort of deduction of what is happening. Uh, in my case, there was some mild kyphosis, so you don't really see the cord moving and the, the differential diagnosis in the image was very difficult. The good thing of bringing this case is that 
once you see one case of this, you will never forget it. So yep. in case one of our colleagues come in their practice across one of these cases, they will always remember this presentation. Uh, once you see it, you realize that it's a typical presentation of this pathology. I don't want to move forward in what I see because I don't want to open the case too early. So before yeah, Satish moves on, one thing is of important is importance is that the CSF column suddenly increases in its posterior aspect and the cord shifts anteriorly. That is very typical of a spinal cord herniation. Satish will move forward, please. Yeah. So, and ultimately, it's definitely a case of spinal cord herniation. What is important here in the scan is you see the cord changes, which is there is a myelomalacia change anteriorly. And the dura, there is a small break in the dura anteriorly. So what to be done next? It is a classical case of ventral herniation of the thoracic cord at D7 level with thoracic myelopathy. Yvonne, uh, you, you have anything to say? Uh, what to do next? How do you approach this? Hi Satish, first of all, it's a pleasure to see you again. So many years, it's a huge honor. You look so fancy hey, today. <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, uh, as, as Marcelo says, I, I only see one case of this in, in my life because they're very, very, very infrequent. And, you know, it's, it's not so easy to make the diagnosis. I, I, I am so proud here that everybody looks like a piece of cake, you know. For, for me, it was a, <laughs> a huge challenge at that time to make, make the diagnosis because even was the youngest patient, have 16, 15, so we think it's something malformative or, or, or another thing. The issue here is you need to try to fix that problem because that will be worse eh, this, as again, I believe everybody says that this look like idiopathic herniation of the spinal cord and you need to, to fix that, that, that problem as soon as possible to, to protect that, that the spinal cord. Okay. Well, so we, we planned in the following manner that you know, we wanted to do the pedicle screw fixation at D6 to D8 level, D7 laminectomy, D7 one-sided pedicle excision, and exploration of the anterior dura, because unless you take off the pedicle, you cannot go to the anterior part of the dura, and identification of the defect in the dura, and repositioning of the herniated cord back to the canal, and ventral duraplasty you know, with fat and graft, all so to be done under neural monitoring. Satish. So this is how we started. Here is a small video. Pedicle screw was applied, cephalad and corded, and I drilled the pedicle on one side. I did completely unilateral approach. <clears throat> I drilled the pedicle to thin it out so that you know I'll come closer to the, the bottom of the uh, vertical body. This is the baseline you know, MEP. Then the dura was opened post from the posterior. And that is the arachnoid I'm opening. And you can clearly see there's a cord is completely gone in. There is a depression there at one point. And that is a dentate ligament. You have to cut the dentate ligament at two levels before you open. So when you dissect the dentate opening, you can clearly see there is a depression. There's a hole in the anterior dura. And the anterior part, the cord is completely sinking in. So you have to make sure the dura is flat. See there, that is a cord constantly you have to monitor the, this thing. That is a sclerosed cord, which has gone in and there is a dural defect. And this is the herniated cord, which I slowly moved it forward. It is almost like a tonsil you see in a case of foramen magnum decompression. There is a sclerosed cord tissue. And then after lifting in that gap, I filled the fat because we had to literally fill it and then put the graft, pull it from the other side. This is a facial latter graft. I put it above and below that defect so that it will go to the opposite side. And the graft has to be stitched, otherwise it will float off because of the CSF anteriorly. So then we closed it. So when I closed it, it's perfectly all right. And MEP at the end was as normal as anything else. So everything went on well, <clears throat> as planned. And in the post-operative period, 
the immediate post operate there's absolutely no neurological deficit and no alteration and but i kept because the herniated cord has come out and the canal is adapted to the new cord uh, the canal will be definitely tight and because of the handling i was definitely expecting some edema though he was completely neurological and normal in addition he was a very obese person so on the first post operative day at 6:45 am i got a call from my resident saying that he is feeling patient is feeling heaviness in the numb and numbness in the bilateral lower limbs and at 7:30 am his power dropped to 3 by 5 and severe spasticity and the next you know i had already scheduled an acoustic schwannoma to operate on the same day when i went at 8 o'clock you know this is the scenario so what to be done next was a question for me so can anybody tell why did he worsen So, uh, Satish, uh, before uh, going on to worsening, why did he worsen? I think the next step would be uh, sort of an imaging. Could you arrange for an emergency imaging? So we arrange for the imaging. Imaging, I'll show you. And if, what are you looking at the imaging? Is there a hematoma? Hematoma. Okay, then. That would be impossible. Would yes, you have got surgery? You are. yeah it is unusual because i have done a clean surgery so i will tell you what happened okay and how to go buckling, about it buckling of the fascia buckling of yeah. the buckling of the fascia inside buckling of the fascia okay you so this is you know in the post operative period at 8:30 am i gave a methyl prednisolone to him and i canceled my previous surgery and serial assessment was done you know because i had already started that surgery so power worsened by 9 am and 11 am for you know completely further worsening because the other case was started so i had to do the both the things and we gave a small sedation to him dexam and bedside we did a mep the mep showed the pre operative on the left side and the post operative at 11 am there is a flattening which is happening so in the icu itself i did it mep showed a complete absence of waves in the bilateral lower limb then i came out of the surgery and this is what went through my this thing clinically asia d to asia b despite starting the steroid therapy mep showed no conduction across the cord and this is the imaging which we did the imaging showed there is no hematoma the fat graft i have put was all right but i found small edema within the cord and because of the pedicle screw there is you know complete disarray of the imaging but only thing is my radiologist said there is no hematoma at all so what i did i took him back you know to the or then family counsel they were completely worried patient was taken to the emergency exploration and this is the mep immediately before opening so i opened the dura as soon as i opened you see here the cord is normal the fascia latte graft which i put at you know i took extra i did not do the grafting at that time i closed with the same normal dura as soon as i opened the mep came back so it's purely because i done not done a duroplasty thinking that it was very lax because the csf was let out that gave me the pseudo feeling that the cord can accommodate this dura and when i closed it primary closed it instead of using the duroplasty so the csf letting out made a pseudo feeling that the it can accommodate even the herniated cord when i brought it back so as soon as i opened this is the before opening the dura after opening the dura on the right side mep came back i just did the duroplasty and i came out he was you know this is ultrasound i did preoperatively absolutely no hematoma there is only mechanical compression of the intact cord at the posteriorly and anteriorly there was a mechanical uh, pressure so intraoperative monitoring after opening the dura it improved and i did duroplasty first post operative he became grade 1 sensation came back and started mobilizing on the second day itself family was counseled he was 120 kg after one week patient was moved to the rehab constantly spoken to them and he was sent home on the two weeks they started rigorous physiotherapy in their place he had come from gujarat to me and at the end of you know the one month his power started grade 3 to 4 and this is his video at the end of one month he started walking this is at home at the two months he was still spastic buckling was there but he could manage he lost nearly about 20 kg 
in that two months and this is at six months and he started riding the bike at six months and uh, today at six months you can see is completely the cord is you know completely free csf is flowing both front and back there's a mild kyphosis but he's back to normal so what could i have done better is the muscle patch instead of fat because the fat what happens with the csf it expands you know whenever i crushed it but any fluid which is there the fat expands and it acts as a mass lesion and i should have done a primary duroplasty but i did a primary closure without a duroplasty so that reduced the tissue space and created a problem with the patient and the learning curve is unique case i had to be prepared with unique problems and neurological worsening i should have anticipated i really anticipated early detection was the key and the team managed very well proper use of technology in the teamwork made enormous difference to this patient and family luckily accepted all the thing which i said which gave me calmness and they were not at all perturbed they believed in me and it worked in my favor and periodic communication on the whatsapp and videos and communicating with them made enormous difference even to my psychological boosting and remained positive throughout and made a difference to me and we did publish this and it was a unique case with a unique solution thank you very much thanks satish for a very interesting case we'll accept only uh, one or two questions we have one minute to go i'll start off with the first shooter that it was a fantastic case fantastic follow up excellently managed but again uh, it's always that we think better when the job is done so it is very easy right. to think about the fact that it is very uh, a simple logic that if you put something in the uh, intradurally and you do not give them space obviously the thoracic cord as it is doesn't have much space it gets compromised so any question from anybody please go ahead and ask yeah yeah please yeah. yes more than a question again satish congrats this is really great i, I believe the important here in this case is how you deal with the complication especially to have an early diagnosis and don't waste time you know go straight to to look for a solution after that one when you open the door again and you can see the spinal cord or hematoma you have some time to think and and try to understand the physiopathology but if we spend too much time trying to understand and we don't be operative in this particular case this patient probably could have a much worse uh, neurological lesion so congrats the thing what happened don't have too much explanation could be perhaps you know the flap move a little bit perhaps you as you already can says perhaps you can do a, a duroplasty for the for for the first time but i am not sure if that will be the solution the important here the important thing here is how you deal with the complication and that is amazing uh, congrats again for that but a really great job Thank you. Gautam, you are fabulous. And sir, Satish, is Shankar ready with his case, or can I? Uh, shall we ask uh, Professor Parish? Yeah, let us ask Professor Petriachki. Okay. okay. Uh, but uh, whilst uh, Professor Petriachki loads his case and shares his screen, uh, Satish, when you went in the second time, were you pretty sure what had happened, or was it just that it was an exploration? I mean. would you would it have been a situation that you went in there and you might not have found anything to correct what would have happened there no i was pretty sure that there is a cord edema because it's a slow you know deterioration and the second thing i knew the amount of the fat i pushed in i was pretty sure because you know this fat usually expands when there is a fluid one so okay. i i was very confident because as soon as i open mep came up so i knew that it was just a cord like a brain normally when we do the stroke and everything we know how it reacts similar way the cord reacted and i was pretty sure there is nothing else which was happening right right thank you and the other thing i thought is when the cord i rotated because it's anterior right and i rotated to the left side to bring it to the surface so i was only hoping that there is no you know squeezing of the spinal cord but as soon as i opened i gave extra space i made a big duroplasty and uh, which which definitely made a difference to me but i knew what exactly i'm going to do
Dr. Petriacci. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Good evening to you, to the Indian uh, surgeons, and good afternoon to the Argentinian colleagues. Uh, I will present this case. Uh, this is a patient of 41 years old uh, who present during the quarantine uh, lockdown in Argentina on May 2020. He had a motorcycle accident, sorry. He had a motorcycle accident, a neck and shoulder uh, pain without neurologic compromise. Uh, he wore a helmet during the accident. Uh, and at the moment in the emergency room, he was hemodynamically stable and uh, doesn't have any comorbidities. Mm -hmm. This is the x-rays. Uh, here we can see an AP and lateral cervical x-rays, an open mouth uh, x-ray, and a shoulder x-ray where we can see a clavicle fracture. Uh, at the x-rays in the cervical spine, we cannot see very well uh, what, what is happening, but the patient complains a lot of pain, a, a lot of neck pain. And when we did a CT scan, here we can see different uh, fragments or fractures in the body of the C2. Here we can see some lines uh, that goes in the uh, sagittal view. Also in the frontal view, uh, we can see this and uh, some fracture that goes and, and affect the facet joints in between C1 and C2 and also some part of the, the, the parts of the uh, C2. The MRI uh, didn't show any problems uh, of the ligaments. Here we see different cuts at the MRI. And why, why I, I put like a typical fracture if, if we can, if we try to, to fit in the classical AO spine uh, classification, uh, we should put probably at this uh, type of fracture, but it doesn't say how much the comminution, uh, uh, how, how we fit the, the, the patient in this classification. Uh, also, we have to classify uh, this uh, classification in type A, B, or C. This is, we say that it's type A, but uh, the, the O spine classification shows that this, this kind of fracture are stable injuries. And I'm not sure if this is this kind of stable injuries. Uh, but it has a modifiers, and probably this modifier helps to uh, understand that some kind of fractures could be unstable. But at the moment, we don't know if this uh, fracture is unstable or not. Uh, that's why uh, I found this classification that is a very old classification in 94. And they uh, classify the body fracture of C2 in uh, vertical lines in the coronal plane, sagittal plane, or lines that goes transversally, like a chance fracture. But it doesn't uh, classify the comminution fracture of the body. Later, two years later of that classification, uh, Fujimara puts the first fracture of the C2 like a part of the classification, but they, they didn't uh, explain which kind of burst fracture should be stable or not. Probably we, we have to combine like uh, the Anderson and Alonso classification and say that probably has some, this patient has some, some type of type three. And if we go to the Hangman classification of Fendi, probably is a type one. But this is, this patient has a combination of these kind of fractures. And Maybe this can help us, that is the, the, the classification of subaxial spine, that where a burst fracture could be stable or not, and probably when, when the comminution goes uh, at the facet joints, 
maybe we should uh, classify as an stable kind of fracture. In summary, we have this case uh, that has this kind of fracture and uh, maybe we can discuss if we go for a conservative treatment or a surgical treatment. And if we go to the conservative, which will be your option, or if we go to the surgical treatment, which will be the options? I don't know if you want to discuss this or I should continue with the resolution. Uh, yes, let's put the question to our last speaker, Dr. Satish. Uh, you are an expert in C2 fracture fixation. Please, uh, how would you treat this patient? I will go with uh, the halo vest for this patient. <coughs> you will keep a halo vest for how long? About three months? Yeah, 12 weeks. 12 weeks, three months, yes. yes. Dr. Menon, you have an enormous amount of publication on C2 and hangman fractures. This is similar in that. Uh, what would you do? Yeah, uh, in my practice also, I would prefer to do a, a halo vest. Yes, so I think a majority of the patients, do, uh, people, and what about you, uh, Dr. Banasconi, what would you do? Hello. Yes. I, I think that it's a good opportunity to do an internal fixation and transitory internal fixation for okay. six months and then remove the implants. It's a good option to prevent the, the rigidity at the C1, C2, and at the occipital, occipital cervical level. So we are doing... The, the, screw? Yes, with the screw. We do the internal fixation without fusion, without bone, to try to restore, this, especially the sagittal plane and the distance between the joint, the CO, C1, and C2, and then we remove the implant six months ago after a complete consolidation. It's a part of the body, the upper cervical spine with a good consolidation rate. So it's a good option that we are doing since two years. Uh, Marcelo, a last point before we get Dr. Petracci to show his solution. Yes, I see that uh, all the panelists agree in the treatment because uh, they all propose a uh, some sort of temporary fixation, internal or external. But here my question, and I would like to hear the opinion of Satish and all you that have a lot of experience is really, which is the classic, o sea, how will you classify, how would you put this fracture uh, in your mind to understand the mechanism and uh, following that mechanism of, uh, following mm -hmm. that mechanism, uh, try to propose a treatment because for, the, for me, Matthias make a good point. This is more close like a type A4 of a subaxial injury that compromises the whole body of C2, especially both articular surfaces. And I think that even though this fracture has the potential of healing, it also has the potential of getting deformed before healing. So I agree with that both methods are good options. But what, what do you think about the mechanism? Dr. Menon is our biomechanical expert. We'll get him to answer that question. So, so um, th there is a, a hangmanoid element if you look at the axial section in the, in, in the sense that the fracture is running through the pedicle, at least on one side. Uh, but I think it's predominantly a vertical compression, a pure vertical compression injury like a burst fracture. So uh, you will find that uh, in the coronal pictures, the, the facet joints of the C2 and the, the subchondral bone thereof is, is split vertically into multiple layers. So that, that tells you clearly that a, it's, a, it's an axial compression kind of injury. There's very little flexion or extension mechanism here because uh, posteriorly the, the spinous process of, or, or the posterior elements of C1, C2 have not separated out. The facet joints of C2, C3 have not opened up. So there's hardly any flexion extension. So this is clearly an axial compression injury. So that's, uh, which is essentially to my mind, a stable injury, barring what Marcelo said, that could be late deformity. So you need to probably jack up a little bit of height and with your- Thanks, KV. Uh, but Dr. Petracci, your solution, please. Okay. I suppose we, were, we will discuss all these uh, things 
but we didn't do that. This is other patient. Uh, we didn't do that. That is internal fixation of the of the C2 hangman. That is other case. And also we didn't do that. That is for other kind of fracture that could be uh, in a Hagman uh, fracture, but we had a lot of comminution here and that's why, and the, the C1, C2 facet joints also were involved. Uh, we didn't do the, the allobest uh, that maybe will be the, the first option because the patient didn't want it. And also because he had a, a fracture uh, at the clavicle and probably this will be also inconvenient to, to wear a, a helmet. Uh, also, we didn't do that. That is double approach and, and very unstable hangman fractures. That it, the it patient had two, two approach to consolidate. And what we did it was a temporary uh, fixation in C1, C2 and a C2, C3 facet fusion, all by a posterior approach. As you see here, this is the, the X-rays where we can see the reduction. Probably, probably this was not a good idea to put this uh, screw here because I think it didn't reduce the fracture uh, and maybe push it, it uh, to the front. But uh, we see the reduction of the facet joints in different uh, planes. And as you see also the, the clavicle fracture was operated. This is the 20 days post-op uh, control during the pandemic uh, quarantine. Uh, we had the opportunity to do telemedicine. And now is uh, eight months post-op. The patient has a limitation of rotation of the, of the head, as you see, and no deflection extension. And this is the x-ray at eight months, uh, where we see the healing process and the MRI that doesn't show any inconvenient. And the CT, where we see that the fractures is still is starting to, to heal. The fat set here seems to be uh, pretty well. And uh, more here, we can see the fusion of the facet joints in C2, C3 and uh, the reduction or the, the, the gap here of the this facet joint that I think is good. And uh, here we can see a comparative uh, CT scan between uh, pre-op and eight months, months post-op. The C2 and here uh, we are at, at this moment, eight months post-op. And the discussion will be, uh, should I now remove the, the instrument, the, the pedicle screws or not? I didn't do th this uh, yet, maybe because I am waiting that this gap uh, fills, but uh, probably I will do it in the next uh, months. Okay, this is the end of the presentation. I don't know if you want to comment something. Can I say something? Yes, sure. please, Kevin. So, Go ahead. if you look at, uh, if you can you show the previous slide, please, <clears throat> uh, the one before. So, if you look at the preoperative coronal images, you will see that the facet joint uh, is actually the C1, C2 facet joint, which has been uh, disrupted and which is irregular. It's not the C2, 3 facet joint. So uh, yeah. though it's an excellent technique that you have presented, I'm just wondering what was the rationale of fusing the C23 and not the C12? Because here's the, the C12 is what is disrupted. If you are liable to get arthritis in the future in any joint, it's the C1, C2 joint rather than the C23. The, this was for a, for a support uh, at the C3 and the fusion in C2, C3 uh, will not, uh, affect the mobility of the cervical spine. And I prefer to have another uh, uh, point to support below the C1, uh, below the C2 facet joint. I think that this uh, like a floating facet joint. Uh, 
Thanks. I think uh, Dr. Petrachi, it was a very atypical case. And uh, for the brevity of time, I will invite our next speaker. Uh, Thank you very my much. My co-moderator, Dr. Imerish, can please invite and introduce the next speaker. Yes. Who is Marcelo Gruenberg. Yes. So Marcelo Gruenberg is a young surgeon from Argentina. He's probably a rising star in the future. Uh, we need to have some patience. <laughs> But I believe everybody knows Marcelo. Marcelo is, is one of the big shots here in Latin America, not only in Argentina. And always it's a pleasure to share some experience with, with, with Marcelo. And Gotan, before Marcelo speak, we are a little bit jealous, the Argentinian surgeons, because you not only have a C2, spec, a, a C2 expert as Satish, you even have a C2 expert in biomechanic in rare fractures on C2. That, that is amazing. Yeah, that is a good thing to, you are so many, you have ex, especially experts for every little thing, but, but it's amazing, Dr. Menon, your, your comment was, was really nice. So Marce, if you want to, to start with your case. Yes, I am sharing my screen. Are you able to see it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, this case, I, I brought it because uh, it, it will complement uh, Gaston's uh, previous presentation. This is a case uh, that represents really a, a, a good portion of our degenerative cases at the Italian hospital in Buenos Aires. Our population is really old, but they want to remain active. And this is a clinical problem we face very commonly at our office. This is about a 76 year old female that basically com complains of chronic low back pain, but is uh, very severe and actually is, uh, is uh, making her uh, regular life almost impossible. She also have a sciatic pain since a couple of months. On physical examination, the low back pain is eight in 10 and the right sciatic pain that uh, reflect the trajectory of uh, the L5 dermatoma with no, with no deficit, uh, relief completely at rest or sitting. As you see, the background of this lady is uh, pretty poor, but this is the regular patients we are uh, seeing at our office. So let me so, uh, show you the raw images of this lady standing. Um, you can see the a frontal and sagittal imbalance. You can see a very severe uh, uh, degenerative disease at the lumbar spine. To put numbers on this, you can see the double curve, 33 to the thoracic, 36 to the lumbar. And on the sagittal plane, you see a very severe 16 centimeters SVA uh, and a mismatch between the pelvic incidence of 68 a lumbar lordosis of 28. The patient is trying to compensate that with a 26 hypokyphosis thoracic curve uh, and trying to move her pelvis as much as she can, but she's obese, so another point against us. On flexion extension lying x-rays, you clearly see that she recovered a plenty good amount of lordosis on the extension, and you can see how the discs collapse inflection. Uh, there's not much to say about the bending films. The thoracic curve is more flexible as expected. Here you have with numbers for the thoracic curve goes from 42 to seven and the lumbar curve moved from 40 to 30 as expected also. As you will probably expect uh, several degenerative changes on the lumbar spine with several foramen uh, with stenosis, uh, some uh, central canal stenosis also. Just to have a view of the axial uh, canal, you see stenosis at L3, L4, L4, L5. Remember that the clinical symptoms match uh, an L5 root compression. So that can be in the central aspect of 3, 4, or more lateral aspect of four five. Interesting to see that uh, when lying for the CT, the lordosis uh, improve a little, 
and you see how the disk open showing a nice example of the vacuum phenomenon uh, of which Gaston told us about before. This is what a uh, more detailed view of what we uh, describe as a vacuum accordion phenomenon for you. If you don't know, accordion is a typical Argentinian instrument in which there is a, a place of the instrument that expand and contract, sending air to other parts of the instrument to make the noise. So you see, when you see the X-ray and then you see the CT line, you can imagine this accordion phenomenon of the spine collapsing and extending. To measure this on the frontal plane, you see clearly that from a 36 degrees standing scoliosis, the patient moved to 11 degrees uh, curve just by lying. The correction is seen better here than in the bending films that uh, explain the accordion phenomenon, the axial instability. So in summary, 67 year old female with several comorbidities with the main symptom of chronic severe uh, incapacitating low back pain and a secondary right sciatic pain that improves at, at rest. Um, so at this point, I think we can start discussing about which are the treatment options for this lady. Yes, Marcel, thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I, I would invite any one of the moderators, Shankar Acharya, to comment on the case and tell us uh, what are the treatment options. Uh, thanks, Samajit. I think uh, this is a, a Dijan Scully, which as Marcel has shown very uh, nicely that on lying down itself, it corrects so much. So I think uh, obviously the ideal would be to jack up from the front. So if you can do multiple olives or a lifts uh, and then do a posterior uh, fixation, that would be ideal, which would be probably more minimally invasive. But in my hands, I would probably do an S2 alert to T11 fixation and uh, use multiple level T lifts or lifts in this case. Okay, so any other options available to any other moderators? Uh, KB, would, would you put in a comment? Yeah, I would probably do something very similar. Um, not very good with OLIFs, so my approach would be almost entirely posteriorly and with perhaps T lifts at the bottom, L5, S1, the others I would just do post lateral fusions. So anybody would consider any MIS techniques? Uh, I will do OLIF. I will do three level OLIF and then you know, percutane screw fixation for this patient. Two to one, Satish? Yeah, I will do mainly three, four, four, five, and five S1. So it's a posterior MIS for two to five or three to five? Uh, um, three to one. Two, two to one or three to one? Two to one. Two to one. So your choice would be a. Uh, uh, olive at two, three, three, four, four, five, and yeah. posteriorly L two to S one percutaneous screws with the yeah. MIS T lift from the back at L five S one. Am I correct? Correct. Right. So can you go ahead and show us uh, 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 further about the case? Yes. Thanks. I think that the opinion of the panel reflects that uh, even though everybody wants to do the same, recover lower doses. Uh, fuse the more degenerative aspects of the spine. Uh, the different alternatives show that there is no clearly one good option for an obese patient with osteoporosis in which you have to recover your doses. So we agree with those uh, inconvenience. And even though you can do it in a minimally invasive uh, fascia, fashion, probably having less complications in the immediately post-op, uh, period. In this patient, we have a lot of complications related to non-union uh, and uh, junctional uh, problems. So in this particular patient, we try to uh, use a more minimal invasive procedure. In this case, we perform a discoplasty on the two levels that have the most remarkable accordion phenomenon, those uh, changes in the uh, in, in axial uh, loading. Here you see some pictures of the, of the technical procedure. This is what we do. 
So let me show you the post-op immediately image. Uh, believe me, this is the same patient, probably with less pain, the patient is able to correct her position better. Uh, let me put some numbers on this. Uh, the curve, remember it was in almost 40, changed to 20. The sagittal imbalance that was 16 centimeters went back to four centimeters. Uh, so this is a comparison in the frontal plane. Even though we are not after the correction really, the correction is a secondary benefit from stabilizing the disc that stopped collapsing when the patient is standing up. And the most important correction here, you can see it on the sagittal plane. She went from 16 centimeters to four uh, with a procedure that is ambulatory and has really comparison with the uh, option of, of, of uh, deformity correction surgery, you can imagine that is much, much less uh, in, in relation of uh, complications. So the pain, of course, didn't disappear completely because we didn't take care of all the pain uh, uh, of the pain producers, but the VAS score went from uh, 10 to three and the radicular pain went away completely. And this is her one year follow-up that you can see that her numbers remain uh, the same. We can close here the discussion if you want with questions. Uh, Marcelo, there's a question from the audience. Couple of questions are there. How much cement per level? And have you seen any radio necrosis of the adjacent vertebral body following discoplasties? Uh, we have been doing this complexity for the last, I think, six years. We have a couple of hundred patients, so we already saw all the complications uh, that are described and some that are not described. Uh, sclerosis, um, osteonecrosis adj adjacent to the cement, we didn't see it. You have to take into account that we do this only on patients that are above 70 years. And the amount of cement we use depends on the amount of, um, it's not a fixed number, that will depend directly on the amount of uh, opening of the disc we obtain on the operative table that Gaston shows us uh, before. Usually it's between two and a half and four and a half centimeters. Okay, thank you very much. I think we'll move quickly to the last case of the session, Dr. Shankaracharya. Uh, in the meanwhile, I would like to welcome Dr. John Lonstein, who has just joined us. Uh, Dr. Lonstein, welcome from the Association of Spinal Surgeons of India, sir. Uh, we are running about 10 minutes late, so I'm afraid you'll have to wait a little bit. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. we can. Go ahead, Shankar. Okay. Sorry about that. I think I was mm -hmm. not upgraded as a panelist, so I couldn't share my screen. Anyway, so this is a young girl, 14 years with no comorbidities, mm -hmm. had, came to me with neck pain and difficulty. I mean, she came to me a little later, but she complained of neck pain and difficulty to move for two months, dull lake around the interscapular region for more than six months. And though she had classical symptoms of fevers and some weight loss and decrease in appetite, her parents did not seek uh, uh, any medical treatments till two months ago. They went to, they live outside Delhi, so in the periphery uh, where Maruti is located, and she visited a local hospital center and she was em give, uh, empirically diagnosed at pot spine and given empirical treatment. So as you know, in India, we get four drugs and then three drugs for 10 months. So she was started on four drugs. And uh, on examination, systemic examination was normal. She had a very small kyphotic deformity of the cervicothoracic junction, which was tender really. And she was not moving her neck much. She was very, very afraid to move her neck at all. And uh, she had early spasticity signs and Babinski test on bilateral lower limbs was positive actually. So this is uh, quickly the pictures I've put in the x-rays and the uh, MR picture as well. So as you can see, uh, she was already on uh, empirical treatment of tuberculosis for two months. She had not improved. She has a T2 uh, uh, collapse, uh, T2, an upper body of T3 and T1, upper uh, lower body. And there's a large abscess uh, uh, with some kyphosis. So with this, and I've shown you the blood test, nothing uh, specific apart from a raised ESR and some CRP. Otherwise she was normal. 
nutritionally she was normal as well so can i ask the panelist can i ask uh, basu what you would do non when i counseled her for halo but i would ask the panelist uh, what would you do non operative management and continue att or would you get a biopsy and then do att would you get a biopsy halo and att or would you surg do surgery and if so what surgery would you do so uh, before proceeding further uh, if she is not improving even after a month or 6 weeks two months two months therapy yeah two months so that means it's time to sit up sit up in two things firstly whether there is any instability going on or not for that a ct would be ideal to see the amount of bone destruction if the amount of bone destruction is significant more than a couple of vertebral bone is gone then it's time for intervention surgical intervention for me any other panelists can give in their opinion please hello what do you uh, want to say anything somya ji what uh, approach will you take anterior posterior combined i would do I a posterior think. only if if the ct i suspect that the ct would show me uh, one and a half to a couple of vertebral bodies lost so i would definitely do it posterior and do a cervical thoracic instrumentation with tapered rods and by bi bifacetal approach i go in from the uh, uh, posterior into the anterior aspital cord take out the granulation tissue i suspect that there would be no pass there would be more of granulation tissue i would try to avoid a laminectomy if necessary i'll take out a couple of facet joints and then go in anterior to the cord on both sides do a thorough lavage collect enough material for biopsy and that's it do a posterior stabilization posterior fusion and wait and watch marcelo you were answering well, is this a common I, problem in the in argentina well uh, i mean i'm ashamed of speaking about this with a more uh, renowned expert in the world but uh, I can tell you that in this particular case, uh, with uh, this type of uh, destruction, with deformity and with cord compromise so severe, I have no doubt that the patient needs surgery. I will go from the front, make a one level, one level and a half corpectomy. Uh, since the sternum is so low in the in relation with the thoracic spine, I think that everything can be done from the anterior aspect of the spine. right lovely so we've got two different opinions basu who wants to do all posterior marcelo who wants to do anterior all anterior is there anybody who has a who wants to do a front and back in this case no so I, everybody falls into one or the other uh, group since nobody let me ask dr banasconi dr banasconi you are still here can you tell us what you would do for this case oh yes i, I think that is a very unstable and compressive injury at the very uh, at the transition a very dangerous transition the cervical thoracic transition i prefer to do the circumferential approach by uh, by yeah. posterior oh. and try to reduce and try to remove the posterior lamina and then by a posterior approach try to go to the front and, and to do the rest of the decompression and the reconstruction of the anterior part Right thank you very much uh, so we move on shankar what did you do okay so uh, i think we have discussed this already and so i thought that since the sternum is low as marcelo said and i looked up the literature uh, and uh, normally when the sternum is low i tend to go anteriorly because uh, uh, so posteriorly cervical thoracic fixation especially when you put in lateral mass screws Uh, the fix is not too well and you're never confident so i always like to do a circumferential surgery in these uh, low cervical thoracic ones so i put an anterior bone graft and a plate and then posteriorly now, of course uh, since the sternum was low i was tempted to do this anteriorly and there was no i thought i don't have to do a meniscectomy or a split sternum so this is what i did and interestingly as uh, i went into the literature after a complication which i'll discuss Uh, you can actually go into up to T3 from an anterior without splitting the sternum or manubrium by actually having two three there are three corridors and there in which you can approach and this paper has done about 150 cases uh, by CT analysis and then doing them of course i was not aware of this paper before and uh, i know so i didn't do a CT and i went ahead and did an anterior surgery So we did an anterior T1 to T3 fusion with an anterior iliac crest graft, and then I sub supplemented it with posteriorly. The total period was 
structural ATARs, anesthesia time from induction, positioning, then doing the anterior work, taking the bone graft, and then positioning the patient posteriorly, and then doing the posterior surgery. Posteriorly, of course, I didn't open anything, and I just uh, fixed it. Uh, intraoperatively, there was no problem. The patient did well. And extubation was uneventful at 8 p.m. From 9 p.m., her BP started rising and it recorded. She was a young girl, as you know, so normally BPs are not high in them. And the highest recorded was 160, and the pulse was also high, and normal respiration and oxygen saturation. First post op day, the BP became still remained higher, and the heart rate had increased to 150 beats per minute, and urine output was 1 ml per kg. And they started uh, in April. So our IC, uh, ICU consultant started on an April of patients. When she complained of weak voice, she was still able to speak a little bit with dysphonia and she had a weak voice. On the fifth post op day, due to persistent low voice and dysphonia, I called the ENT surgeon because I was worried. We had uh, put in a rice tube. And uh, then the ENT surgeon uh, did a laryngoscope, fiber optical laryngoscope. And he said there was total bilateral paradoxical movement on phonation and there was bilateral uh, laryngeal nerve palsy. So that really put a fright. And he said that we may have to do a tracheostomy because this seems to be bilateral and they are uh, serious. Uh, so, uh, I land up with two complications. One is a bilateral vocal cord palsy uh, due to recurrent laryngeal nerve. Though, uh, during surgery, I did, uh, apart from probably a little more retraction, there was nothing untowards during the surgery. And then I had a temporary baroreflex failure. And uh, this has also been recorded in anterior surgery, though, so I could find uh, and that uh, you can get suddenly uh, abnormal blood pressure and heart rate. We gave her prednisolone on decreasing dose, and our the INT surgeon said, if you want to avoid a tracheostomy, we can wait a couple of days uh, because the patient is not aspirating as on rice to feet, and uh, then started speech therapy. Uh, only after the eighth day, the blood pressure normalized to normal dramatically, and heart rate was decreased. And uh, we on the eleventh post op day, we did a fiber optic lens again and noticed improvement in vocal cord tonation. Uh, we then discharged her on 13th day and kept the rice tube explaining that the voice will probably come back because I was very reluctant to do a tracheostomy and having read the complications after the surgery, I was really frightened as to what would happen. Uh, I, due to lack of time, I won't go to this uh, baroreflex uh, concept, but it is a negative feedback to control the blood pressure and if it gets uh, uh, depressed, then you can have a high blood pressure and high heart rate. Uh, there have been only two cases reported apparently from the literature. Uh, this also is not common. And most of them have been described in cervical myelopathy, post injury, there's one, and uh, fracture dislocations, but none have been described from a routine uh, case, uh, elective case of uh, instability due to tuberculosis. And uh, there have been very few cases of bilateral uh, vocal cord palsy. And it is a life-threatening complication. And four cases have been described, of which one died and one had per per uh, permanent tracheostomy and two recovered. So there have been also some cases described in after laminoplasty. And they say the flexion of the cervical spine can cause laryngeal edema. Normally, as a routine, we also deflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube on all cervical spine surgeries, and we measure the cuff pressure to and keep it below 20 to 24 or 2. And uh, so that is routine practice to in our all cervical spine cases. So that also is important, but we have done this in this case also. Thank you, Shankar. That one was... second, one second. I will tell you the latest. Uh, 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 there are many surgeries available, and this is uh, uh, the last video, six it's weeks. Off. Off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you can now see after six weeks, she has completely recovered. And uh, that is how I saved my skin because this was a big complication. And since uh, this is the first time I encountered this complication, uh, 
I thought I would it would be nice to present this. Any comments from anybody in the audience on the panelists? I think that was an excellent case, Shankar. But due to the paucity of time, I don't think we can go ahead with a lot of questions. But one final comment from my co-moderator, and then we'll hand it over to Gautam. Again, thanks for presenting this excellent case, Shankar. Really bilateral vocal cord pulses. I have never seen one. Thanks for educating me. Yes, again, the same. Congrats, it was a really interesting case. We, we learned a lot of things. It's nice to learn from the problems of others. <laughs> that, that usually is I really nice. I think we have a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, that is really nice. You know, in, in name uh, probably of Juan Pablo Bernasconi, Marcelo Gruenberg, Matias Petracci, Gaston Camino, and myself, thank you, thank you so much for this nice opportunity to learn from you and share experience from you. We, we have uh, always have plenty of friends in India and we, we are a really small country compared with India and we, we learn so many things from you. you. You are really, really amazing every time we have this opportunity. So uh, with any doubt in any of all of us, uh, thank you, thank you so much for this beautiful opportunity. Thank you to uh, Dr. Basu and Dr. Emirich for moderating the last session. I thank the speakers in the session, Dr. Grunberg, Dr. Patriarchi, Dr. Shankaracharya, and Dr. Satish. All four cases were excellent with great learning points. This brings us to the end of this combined session. Uh, let me start by saying personally as to how much I've enjoyed this session today right from those uh, the early lectures by Dr. Emerich on cervical, kyphos, uh, cervical kyphosis and cervical myelopathy to his line, posterior line, which he described for us to be able to diagnose the problem and decide on treatment to Dr. Bernasconi's lecture on the double rod technique in adult scoliosis to the discoplasty technique of Dr. Camino and uh, subsequently, the two case presentations by Dr. Emirate, uh, by Dr. Uh, Grunberg and Dr. Petracci, all of them were fantastic, had all had fantastic learning points. And I think as a group, as a whole, ASSI has gained from this interaction from with you. I thank each and every one of you wholeheartedly for your participation today. And on behalf of the president, Dr. Chabra, I hope that we will continue to interact in the future on many more occasions at many more fora and hopefully establish a continuing link between SAPVC and the ASSI in the years to come. Some final words from Dr. Grunberg and Dr. Barnas Kony before we end this session. For me, Gautam, there's no much to say. You say everything, and Juan Pablo make a very nice uh, idea of what really feel uh, by working with you. So thanks again. Thank you very much. Dr. Manasconi? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the same like Marcelo for us, for the Argentinian and Spanish Society. It's a fantastic opportunity to, to link with you the India spine surgery. So I am really uh, appreciate your the situation, the participation in this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you and namaste and good night from India. And, uh, we would be, I mean, if you want to stay back, if you have the time, I know it's a working day in Argentina, 